Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. This is KRWG Public Media, TV, radio, online, news that matters. Now, across the Mesilla Valley and the borderland, the stories that shape our community. From the KRWG Broadcast Center at New Mexico State University, this is Newsmakers. Thank you for joining us on this special edition of Newsmakers. I'm Fred Martino. President Trump this week lashed out against the push to impeach him for a second time, defending the speech he made to supporters January 6th. In that speech, Trump urged them to go to the Capitol where Congress was certifying that Joe Biden had won the election. A violent mob then stormed the building, forcing Vice President Pence and lawmakers and staff to seek shelter. Five people were killed in the violence. With me now to discuss this and much more, New Mexico U.S. Senator Martin Heinrich. Senator, it's good to have you with us. And first, we are glad that you and your staff are safe. Uh, tell me uh, about where you were during the insurrection and, and what was going through your mind. Thanks, Fred. Um, you know, I had actually just left the floor of the Senate to go downstairs to make a phone call in the basement of the Capitol uh, and um, was in the hallway getting ready to go into a, an office there and make a phone call when the first uh, Capitol police officer who had been injured, who had been maced in the face was basically being carried, walked down the hall, sort of half carried half on his own two feet. Um, right at the very beginning of this. So I was aware of the situation a little earlier than most of my colleagues. Um, at that point, I went upstairs and began to let my colleagues know that um, it appeared that the, the Capitol Police just simply did not have the numbers and that this situation was going to become very difficult to manage very fast. And I'm sure uh, this is something you never imagined that you would ever face in, in, in such a building that it should be so secure? You know, so much of, of what I was acting on then that at that point was based on seeing this, this officer who had been attacked and hearing the radios go off on the belts of other Capitol Police in the hallway. And, and uh, it was clear that they had lost the perimeter at that point. Uh, I went back out to the window because I wanted you know, I think it was hard for some of my colleagues to process the urgency. Um, I went back off the Senate floor and looked out the windows that face to the west of the Capitol, that face the, the, the mall and also the scaffolding structure where the inauguration is to take place. And at that point, it was, it was pandemonium. I mean, it was a mob of completely unruly, uh, uncontrolled, uh, huge numbers of people climbing on the on, on the Capitol, climbing on the uh, uh, the uh, scaffolding that we used for the inauguration, uh, beginning to rush the building itself. There were uh, Confederate flags being waved and Trump flags being waved, and at that point, I realized that you know it was only a matter of time until the Capitol was going to be breached. And, and I basically had to decide between trying to shelter in an office there or go back to the floor with my colleagues and try to press the case that this is getting completely out of hand. So I went to the floor of the Senate and said, you know, it's only going to be a matter of time before, um, before the Capitol's breached. And within minutes, we, uh, an announcement was made that people were inside the building. It wasn't that long after that until another announcement was made that apparently shots had been fired. Um, we were not sure whether those were, you know, whether those were rubber bullets or real bullets in trying to push people back out of the building. It was from that point on, it was really sort of pandemonium and all the doors uh, to the Senate floor were closed to secure that location until the point at which the Capitol Police moved um, the members from the floor to a separate, separate secure location. It, it was, you know, having um, had a chance to 
travel in places where tensions are high and people are armed. Um, well, um, it was really, um, it was something to see. Okay. You know, uh, you've made it clear that uh, President Trump should be impeached, should not be uh, able to uh, hold office again. I don't want to belabor that, but I, I do want to ask you about something that uh, I have to say that for me personally, sitting at home was really a surreal uh, moment. Even with all that has happened over the last four years, I think a lot of us were truly stunned when we saw the video of President Trump after the insurrection had began and, and he was telling people to go home, but at the same time repeating that the election was fraudulent uh, and saying to the insurrectionist, quote, we love you, you're very special. Uh, with the violence that we saw already by the time that, that he made these comments, uh, to say the least, this was unprecedented and some say uh, extremely dangerous, reckless. Uh, wh what were your thoughts when you saw this? We, uh, we watched that from uh, on television screens in, in a secure location uh, that was largely made up of Republican de and Democratic members of the Senate. And, and I can tell you there was just an enormous amount of, are you kidding me, just disappointment. And, and you know, there are definitely supporters of President Trump, including in the House and Senate, uh, who I think will never break with him. But I saw many people who had defended Trump for, for quote, being Trump in the past, um, who got just how dangerous he is, how he has no remorse for any of these activities. And I think it's important to realize that even more dangerous than, than him inciting this mob was his willingness to create the big lie that that led to this mob being in Washington, D.C. in the first place. And I think one of the most dangerous dynamics is is how many people have been willing without a shred of evidence to just support the big lie that somehow this election was stolen. And when you have to prove actual facts in a court of law again and again and again, this has been shown to be false. But conspiracy theories take root and they have consequences and people die as a result. And uh, I, I am really, I am deeply worried at how many people, including people in very important positions of leadership have been willing to enable that behavior by the president. So uh, as you're aware, uh, some have called for the resignations of Senators uh, Ted, Ted Cruz, Senator uh, Josh Hawley, New Mexico Representative Yvette Harrell, and others who voted against accepting the election results. Uh, and, and sometimes uh, in, in some cases, some of the uh, folks repeating uh, unproven allegations that you're mentioning here. What are your thoughts on this? Should they, should they resign? You know, I'm going to leave that to their individual constituents, but I would say that their actions have, have had meaningful contributions to this happening in the first place. Um, I, I think it's really important to look at the people who enabled this behavior and enabled the president to, to whip a, a crowd into a violent frenzy that acted against the United States. And, um, I, you know, I think that Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz and a lot of other elected officials just thought they were gonna get a freebie on this one, that they got to burnish their Trump credentials they knew they would be in the minority because clearly the, the math is what the math is. And the reality is that there are people who are dead today because of continually 
stoking the fires of this conspiracy theory. And of course, the president is responsible for this, but there were many, many people along the way who enabled the president's behavior. So uh, you've probably also heard this, that some are saying that the uh, Justice Department, beyond uh, the actions that have taken place over the last few weeks, the Justice Department should look at charges against uh, President Trump for his call to Georgia's Secretary of State seeking to overturn the election results there. What are your thoughts on that? My thoughts are that we should return to the normal, um, uh, the normalcy of not having politicians tell the just Justice Department what they should be doing. That should be an independent agency. It serves the country and the Constitution, not the president and not U.S. senators. Yeah. And I think they should make those decisions based on the law and where there are crimes, they should prosecute them. Okay, very clear. And that is certainly what uh, President-elect Biden has said as well when he had introduced uh, Merrick Garland uh, to the public as his choice for attorney uh, general. You know, regardless of, of what happens in court, I, I don't want to run out of time, so I want to move to asking you about what you think it will take to begin healing in this country. Uh, President-elect Biden is uh, making this uh, the, the subject of his first order of business uh, as he becomes president. Well, I, I think one, it starts by simply having um, an adult back in the White House who is going to who's going to govern um, and and not use that position to divide Americans. We're going to have our differences, and we always have. But there are leaders who choose to pit Americans against each other, and there are leaders who choose to try to bring the country together wherever we can. And I think it's hard to underestimate what a, what a change in tone January 20th is gonna represent and just how refreshing it's gonna be for many Americans to wake up in the morning and not feel like they have to check their Twitter feed to see what went awry the night before. Yeah. Um, I also think it's really important to recognize that many of the people who have been caught up in some of these conspiracy theories have very real economic and other grievances that are important to address more systemically. And the fact that we've become a country that is so economically divided is part of why we're so culturally divided. Yeah. And being willing to work on those issues is important. And yeah. I think the next president understands that. Senator, I know another uh, issue in terms of moving us forward and, and healing in the country is dealing with social media. Many social media companies are, some would say, finally uh, taking action, Facebook, Twitter, and others, when their platforms are used to uh, spread violence, even uh, suggest uh, specific acts of violence. What do you make of this issue and uh, how we can move forward on this? Well, I think we need to have a really robust discussion about um, what the proper role of these platforms are and when that crosses the line to a point where the platforms have responsibility for uh, what is going on uh, on these social media uh, various channels. I think we need to understand better the some of the business models here as well too. Um, you know, I've I've watched uh, my own kids and, and how they interact with some of the video streaming services, and some of those algorithms seem to take people to more and more extreme places from very innocuous places. And uh, you know, clearly the the social media companies have really had a, a very friendly hands-off legislative or legal arena in which to work 
And I don't know that that has served the nation well. And I think we, we probably need to have a really robust discussion about what kind of responsibility, what crosses the line and whose responsibility is it uh, to shut off the circuit when, uh, when these platforms are being abused as they clearly are. Certainly uh, something I'm sure we'll talk about again in the future. Probably uh, we could spend an entire show on that issue. Well, you know, along with the terrible events of the past few weeks, there was also a lot of celebration in Georgia uh, with the historic Senate runoff election there. The Reverend Raphael Warnock uh, becoming the state's first African-American senator. John Ossoff becoming the nation's youngest senator at 33 and Georgia's first Jewish senator. Your thoughts on this? It was just a remarkable thing to watch um, that the the level of turnout in Georgia was just historically off the charts and to see people um, it's from both sides turn out in such large numbers and understand that that these elections have enormous consequences for the country um, was it was a heartening moment. It was democracy in action. And I was up quite late, uh, you know, hitting refresh and watching the uh, the returns come in. And I, I think these are two incredibly uh, dynamic candidates who complement each other in, in many ways. Um, and uh, I, I am really looking forward to getting to know both of them and getting the opportunity to work with them, um, uh, uh, you know, starting from a career from what was clearly a very historic moment uh, in American and, and Georgian history. Yeah, and you you hit the nail on the head there. It was all about turnout, enormous turnout, uh, more young people, more minorities going to vote. And as you know, uh, nationally, uh, because of certain inequities with the Electoral College for the presidential elections, and many other races due to gerrymandering, Democrats really have to have huge turnout in many cases in order to win. Do you think there are any uh, lessons that Democrats can draw from Georgia, specific things that can be moved to other states? Absolutely, I, I, you know, I've been on a number of uh, calls with Stacey Abrams over the course of the, the year and what happened in Georgia did not happen in the last two weeks of the campaign. It was years of sustained investment at the community level and the kind of organizing that is capable of overcoming the, the sort of ridiculous, uh, inaccurate television commercials that have become the norm. And so I, I really think that the work that so many people in Georgia, and she's obviously well known because of her runs for office and well known on the national stage, but there are a myriad of organizations from various communities at work in Georgia at the community-based level. And, and I think that really laid the foundation that these two campaigns were then able to build upon. Yeah, and I think we should all just say uh, the obvious here that uh, getting more people to vote is a nonpartisan issue. It's simply something that is part of, of, of how democracy works. And that's something that, that I don't think we hear enough of and we need to hear more of. In fact, in the last year, we heard just the opposite of, of, yeah. of some politicians, including President Trump, implying that we should restrict uh, the number of people uh, of voting and do things to make it less likely that people would vote. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to run out of time and I don't want to do that. So I want because I want to get to some of the things that now you can work with the new senators from Georgia on. And, and first among uh, the issues, of course, is COVID-19. Uh, there's talk of additional relief as well as uh, putting money into this vaccination effort that uh, is so critical to the country moving forward. Yeah, I think that is clearly job one is going to be uh, recovering the country, both the country's health and our economy 
from the pandemic that we've been struggling with for almost a year. Clearly the vaccine rollout has been flawed. Um, we had this amazing research and development effort on a timeline that we have never seen in world history, but the fundamentals of having a federal government making sure that the lines of distribution are actually in place and accounted for and things can happen quickly just isn't there. So having a, a change, a turn of the page with the new administration that is willing to take the responsibility to make sure that we rapidly ramp up the distribution of these vaccines, as well as simultaneously working on the economic aspects, which have been absolutely devastating for so many small businesses and so many individuals who, who you know, are, are months behind on their rent or their mortgage. Uh, I think those are in, those are the things that we need to to address right out of the gate uh, with this new Congress. Another thing that I know that you consider a, a major priority, as do many uh, Democrats in the House and the Senate, is uh, dealing with climate change. And I know that you have been uh, specifically working on clean energy tax credits as one way to do that. Tell me briefly about that. Well, we actually just passed a, a piece of climate legislation that because it was wrapped up in all of these end of year politics, I, I don't think we'll ever get the, uh, the recognition that it probably deserves. But the, what we passed at the end of last year was literally the biggest climate bill that's ever been passed in the United States of America. Uh, for one, we were able to successfully phase out hydrofluorocarbons. Uh, not doing that could cause as much as 1.8 degrees of Fahrenheit of warm, warming. These are incredibly powerful greenhouse gases. And we're now on a path to phase them out worldwide because America very much sets the bar for the rest of the world. Uh, in addition, we were able to extend clean energy tax incentives and invest robustly in things like energy storage that are going to allow us to completely decarbonize our grid. Okay. Well, uh, is there any specific item that was not included uh, that you think is an urgent priority to, uh, to move forward? And it'll be easier, perhaps, to do that now with uh, President uh, Biden and uh, Democrats controlling the Senate as well. Yeah, there are still many challenges ahead. We, we really need to be investing in the infrastructure of clean transportation. Um, we, we should, you know, in my view, a robust infrastructure package early in the next Congress is going to be a climate bill as well as an infrastructure bill, if we can pull that together. And uh, electric charging infrastructure is a critical component of that. Making our, our transmission systems work better in the country, that's a huge bottleneck for additional clean renewable generation. And then moving on to the whole next wave of decarbonization, really the electrification of large swaths of our economy, including transportation, but also uh, space heating and home heating, um, things that very much today are done with fossil fuels. There are a lot of things to work on, and I, I'm excited about really trying to make, instead of having one big climate bill every, you know, six to 10 years or more, uh, making each and every bill, every appropriations bill, every authorization bill, viewing it through what can we do to clean up our economy, to put people to work, and to get a hand on the, the climate change threat that exists. Um, that's what excites me about the incoming administration and a new Congress. I don't have to tell you that uh, despite the climate crisis and the availability of more fuel efficient vehicles, a lot of people are still buying gas guzzlers. Do you think any legislation might offer incentives to people to buy uh, hybrids or plug-in hybrids uh, as well as electric vehicles? Yeah, no, absolutely. That was one of the things that we were not able to include in the previous package. Uh, with Republican control of the Senate. My hope is that we will continue to incentivize directly, not just, you can't get your way, you can't efficiency your way to zero. 
So we really need to turn the corner to new technologies that exist today that our labs have been working on for decades. Electrification of light transportation, including some very heavy duty trucks, um, you know, it, it is going to change the way we view transportation. Incentivizing that faster is a very important piece of how we decarbonize the entire economy. And when you see a truck that can go zero to 60 in between three and four seconds and can tow, uh, you know, what, what more, more than an F-350 diesel can today, um, you realize that the potential for this technology is is in no way limiting yourself to smaller, weaker approaches to things. It's actually better technology that for those of us, you know, I used to own an F-350 diesel, it lifted four by four. You can do all of that better with electrons than you can by burning fossil fuels. And, and that's the future that I'm excited about. Well, good luck on that. We look forward to hearing more uh, as uh, the legislation is put together and uh, maybe we can talk again uh, when that happens. Look forward to it. Thank you for joining us. And we are again glad you're safe and appreciate the time that you've given uh, to us today and to our viewers in Southern New Mexico and far West Texas. Thanks, Fred. Best to you and your viewers. Thank you. Well, President Trump said that he wanted to make history, and he has, becoming the only president to be impeached twice. He's also the first president since Herbert Hoover in the Great Depression of 1932 to lose the presidency, the House, and the Senate, and one of just five elected presidents to lose all three. With more than 81 million votes, Joe Biden also made history, more votes than anyone ever. Join us for live coverage of the inauguration of the 46th president of the United States, Joe Biden, Wednesday morning, starting at 8.30. For all of us at KRWG News, I'm Fred Martino. Thank you for joining us and have a good week.